Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. Welcome to Impact. Uh, welcome to what promises to be a very interesting and wonderful talk by Dr. Uh, Alexei Karinovska. Um, my name is Niels van Doorn. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in new media and digital culture at the University of Amsterdam. And I was uh, asked to moderate this talk, which I was happy to uh, do. So now I'm here. And uh, what we're going to do is I'm just going to briefly introduce Dr. Karanowska. Um, she's, she will have a talk. Uh, yeah, you can already. <laughs> That's Dr. Karanowska. Uh, she will talk for about, I think, about 40 minutes, after which we'll have about 20 minutes left for a conversation. Uh, I will initiate that conversation, but I hope the, inf the, the conversation will also include many of you here. Um, so, um, having said that, I'm going to grab my laptop because that's where I haven't memorized uh, the, this bio biography, this introduction, so I'm going to use my laptop. There we go. Dr. Ali Alexei Karinovska is a director or the director of technology at the Institute of Digital Archaeology, uh, IDA. IDA is a joint venture between Harvard University, the University of Oxford, and the Dubai Future Foundation, promoting the development and use of digital imaging and 3D techniques in archaeology, art history, and museum conservation. Dr. Karanowska is also a magnetician, not a magician, but maybe someday, but not a magnetician, uh, based in the Department of Physics at the University of Oxford, as well as a ma oh, no, as well as a fellow uh, by, elec uh, by a special election of Magdalen College, Oxford. Trained as an engineer and a physicist, she directs uh, the IDA's technical team with a particular interest in the application of th uh, 3D printing technologies to the resp restoration or replication of damaged or destroyed archaeological structures and artifacts as well as the development of new technologies for the characterization and preservation of heritage objects. It's a real pleasure to have her here today, so please help me welcome Dr. Alexei Karanowska. Thank you so much, um, and thank you uh, to, to the organizers for the opportunity to be here. Um, it is, uh, it, it's, it's a great pleasure, particularly to be part of a session where I know we're going to be able to have some interesting discussion um, and share some ideas on a topic which um, I think is very, very current, uh, and also uh, speaking both as a scientist and someone who has a real interest um, in our history, in our shared history and in culture, um, very, uh, very, very, very topical. So, um, as, as you now know, um, I am the technical head of the Institute for Digital Archaeology. Um, I'm an academic at the University of Oxford Department of Physics, and I'm also part engineer, um, which will become relevant um, as we move through some more of these slides. Um, so, in fact, actually, that's a good cue. Let's have, could we have the first slide? That's great. So, um, the Institute for Digital Archaeology um, is interested in all aspects of the use of digital technology uh, in the context of cultural heritage documentation, uh, stewardship, restoration, um, and education. And with our director, Roger Michael, I work on the digital recording of archaeological sites on an architectural scale. Um, I work on the development of digital technologies for the representation, uh, restoration, um, and reconstruction, uh, not just of objects, but of monuments and buildings. In fact, in, perhaps in particular, of monuments and buildings. Now, the theme that's brought us together this afternoon is authenticity, uh, what it is, uh, what it isn't, um, perhaps what it has become. And as the field of cultural heritage becomes ever more influenced by new technologies, the communities involved, so academics, educators, museum curators, members of the public, uh, policymakers, uh, you and I, uh, we're finding ourselves, they're finding themselves grappling with ideas about authenticity, with what I think can only be described as a kind of unprecedented intensity. These are interesting times. Now, as a professional academic, I work in two areas. I run a research group working on the fundamental physics of magnetic systems um, and also the development of new quantum technologies. And I also run the IDA's research group, which works on applying physics and engineering to cultural heritage. Now, 
at first glance, these two areas may seem pretty far apart from one another, um, but there is, at a technical level, some important crossover. But actually, these similarities, which are perhaps not obvious, are actually less interesting than what we might observe about the perceived differences. So let's have a, have a, a quick think about what we might think about that, so authenticity. Um, Thinking then about the differences, my work in fundamental science, which is represented by this great, very attractive data on the left-hand side of the slide here, is all about concepts. So I do, I, I do build physical experimental systems, but this is at some very basic level a field whose currency is knowledge about stuff rather than actual stuff. By contrast, the focus of cultural heritage, and this is a, a, a fragment of manuscript um, on the right-hand side of the slide there that we've been doing some imaging work on, um, has, it, it has a real focus on, on objects. The specific physical remnants of the past occupy an important central position. Or at least that's how it seems. So part of what I want to do today is actually to challenge that idea. And I'm going to do so through the eye of one of the IDA's projects. So one of the things we do as an organization is equip teams around the world to take their own stereo photographs of heritage sites. And these photographs, together with many others from other sources, and populate a large-scale, open-access, image-based resource called the Million Image Database. And this is designed to house and curate them. At the moment, it's at a, a rather a proto stage, um, but within a year or so, this will be getting very big indeed. So this is what the database looks like. Now, and it is, it's country-specific, so you can search by country um, and look at individual sites. So as well as being useful in their own right, the images um, which are on this site constitute a kind of digital seed bank. So the information from them can be used to create reproductions of objects for the purposes of allowing access to them by those who would not otherwise be able to experience them in a museum, for example, um, or maybe in a public setting. And, and they're also useful for on-site reconstruction or restoration of objects that are damaged, be it by conflict, natural disaster, or simply natural decay. Now, we work on two types of technology for two tools for physical reconstruction, restoration, and also representation of heritage objects. One of them is 3D printing, and the other is 3D machining. And both of these have been showcased in recent exhibitions. So in particular, um, people might have heard um, about the two major public education events we held this year on London's Trafalgar Square in April and in New York City Hall Park uh, last month. Now, working in close collaboration with our colleagues in Syria, the focus of these large-scale public installations in London and New York was the Palmyra site. And we're able to construct, using the data we have, engineering quality virtual models of objects uh, using the photographs. And this, I'll show you an example here. So this is um, a model of the Arch of the Temple of Bell, which is a, um, an important object on the Palmyra site that have been, that's been constructed in this way. Um, and I think on the next slide here, you can see the, a little bit of the process. So we start with a very rough model in the top right there. Um, going down to the bottom right, uh, we add all the surface texture. Um, and then we can even place it in a virtual environment, add color information. And what you end up with um, is something which really is, has a kind of photographic quality um, observed in this way. It's very difficult to tell the difference between the 3D renderings that we can create and a photograph of the, of the actual site. Um, there's another image here, um, which will be familiar to some people who've seen some of the press coverage of our London installation. Uh, this is the, the center section, or a model of the center section uh, of Palmyra's Triumphal Arch, which has been rendered in Trafalgar Square. And I'll show you now the production of the real thing in marble, which is used, uh, which is uh, happens through 3D machining uh, based on the 3D image files that we've created. Um, and then I think I also have some images here of the erection of the structure in London um, and in New York City. Now, tens of thousands of people came to London uh, and to New York to see the installation. Uh, this is a view of Trafalgar Square just before we, we unveiled it back in April. 
And the, the installation amounted, in, fa in effect, to a kind of temporary museum exhibit, um, one which consisted not only of the object, but also of its immediate, immediate surroundings. So in both locations, through the neoclassical backdrop of the National Gallery in London um, and City Hall in New York, we were able to demonstrate in a living, breathing way the significance of the shared history of the Middle East and the West. Now, we, we also encouraged people to touch the arch, um, to walk through it, to feel its texture, and to linger by it, uh, to explore it in whatever they wanted to do, even um, lean up against it and have their sandwiches, which is what you can see on the, um, on the left-hand slide of the slide here. In fact, even more amusingly still, um, this young girl is on her phone talking to her friend who's trying to locate her uh, and is trying to describe the, uh, the, the arch, which is in the middle of City Hall Park. And it was clear that the person on the other end of the phone you know, thought but could not quite understand you know, what she could possibly mean by the idea of this monument being, uh, being erected in such a kind of familiar uh, open space. So what was interesting was not only um, the, having the ability to let people interact with the object this way, but also to observe people's responses to it. And the range here was very interesting indeed. So to some people, it was only a copy. That was essentially what they, uh, the, what they had to say about it. It was just a copy. And yet to others, and particularly interestingly, um, those from the region, so those people who one might argue um, were more aware than anyone else that it was, in fact, only a copy, it reduced to tears. So the question is, what does this mean? Um, and how do we make sense of it? How do we make sense of this, this dramatic range in people's human responses to the object? Now, I think to make progress, we have to examine the relationship between what it was we did technically. So that is, we built a convincing scale replica of a very old th physical thing, the arch, um, and the very intuitive um, kind of immediate and very human process by which and through which people developed a relationship with it. Now, perhaps the most important general question to ask here is, is there a difference between the technical description of the lack of equality between the experience of a copy and the experience of an actual original thing and the human one? And if there is such a difference, how, if at all, should it influence the way we approach the creation of such non-original representations of heritage material and also the formation of attitudes towards them, which is why we started this discussion. Now, this is a really big subject. Um, it's hard to know how to get in. It's so sort of colossal. So what I want to do for the purposes of getting somewhere is to focus what I'm going to say a little bit by restricting it to the non-imaginative reproduction of physical objects. So the reproduction might be physical, like our triumphal arch, but it could also be digital, like the creation of a 3D model or a virtual experience, a virtual environment. But I'm assuming that whatever form it takes, it's based on a complete information set. So it doesn't include elements that have been imagined or interpolated. And this is the primary focus of what we do as an organization. Now, something we can do very easily here um, is to identify the technical difference between a copy created from an object and the object itself. Um, so I think we would, we would feel rather disappointed in ourselves if we weren't able to do that. And I'm going to suggest that there are really only three, only three differences. The first is compositional. So something that looks exactly like the original may or not be made from the same material of the original. Now, and of course, if it's a virtual rendition, um, it, it's not actually made from anything physical at all. It's just a representation of information. So that's the first one, the composition. The second has to do with known unknowns and unknown unknowns. So what I mean by that is that the copy can 
only, of course, mirror the original with the accuracy to which the detail of the original is known. So in other words, if we examine the copy at a level of detail which sort of exceeds the level of scrutiny um, which has been used in the creation of the copy, then the copy won't look like the original. Okay. So known unknowns and known, known unknowns and unknown unknowns. It's confusing even when I've written it down. The third difference and the final one is that even in the limit, that in a particular case we arrange that these, two, these first two differences are not present. So that is we have a perfect copy made from the same material and that copy is as perfect as it can possibly be with respect to the original. The copy is still not the same thing as the original thing. Now this is of course a statement of the obvious. But as I hope we'll uh, be able to conclude, it turns out it's rather an important one. Because what's quite tricky is to identify how our human responses to the concept of a copy map on to these three technical ones that we've just identified. And this amounts, I think, to asking sort of what is the content of the relationship that we can have with a copy? And how does it differ from the one that we can have with an original object. Now, the first two technical differences that we identified, so compositional and known and unknown unknowns, these are of course important and they're also fairly black and white. Uh, it's, it's clear that we can't get definitive compositional information from a copy alone nor can we learn from the copy information about the object that has been copied that we don't already have. And I think you know, we conclude from this, from an examination of those ideas, um, firstly, the limitations of copying that we know about already, right? Um, and also the imperative for making the copy we create as, accuracy, as, as accurate as it can possibly be. So there are definitely no surprises here. So long as the new object then is true to the original, so that's the copy, um, with a level of accuracy that neither disappoints nor misleads, then it feels like there should be no fundamental opposition to the idea of a copy on either of those two technical grounds. So it's the third difference then, um, the originally apparently trivial one, the fact that the copy is not the same object as the original thing that turns out to be the really interesting one. And the question is, what does this mean to the way that we respond to it and also the way that we respond to our own responses? Now, the relative technical value, academic or otherwise, um, of an original object over, let's say, a very, very high quality copy I would argue is all encapsulated in the compositional issue and the question of known and unknown unknowns. And yet in terms of perceived value, at least in the Western world, the original object generally commands a huge premium, a huge premium over the copy. And my own view that this is, all, is that this is all to do with the way that we respond to the self-evident truth that we discussed a moment ago. So the fact that the copy is not the same thing as the original thing. Now, there are, of course, some obvious things that we can say to explain the feeling we have that an original deserves some kind of special treatment. One is that if the original object is a very old one, then there's something rather special about the fact that it's been around for so long, that so many hands have touched it, that it has, if you like, participated in so much history. But we can ask ourselves, what is the status of statements like, the, like these? It's certainly not, a, not technical. It, they're sentimental. These are sentimental kinds of statements. These warm feelings that we have towards original objects are not actually about the objects themselves. They're about our cultural perceptions of them. And I would argue that as things that are kind of acutely aware of our own mortality, they're also about our inbuilt fascination with objects of longevity and of permanence. Originality is something special because of our human relationship with it, rather than the reality it necessarily embodies. 
Crucially, we feel the same way about an object which we think is original as we do towards the one that actually is, although we might feel rather cross if we feel that we've been deceived um, after having thought that an object uh, was original, which has triggered the kind of emotional responses that an original object has the power to trigger. If we're later told that that object is not original, it's true that we then feel as though we've lost something, but what it doesn't do is negate those original intuitive responses that we had to the object, to that non-original um, object, sort of deceiving object. And I think that quite an interesting corollary of this idea is that it's a mistake to believe that our sentimental attachment to original physical things is actually a comment on the high value that we place on actual physical objects. I would say that instead, it's a reflection on the supremely high value that we place on the non-physical, intangible things that they come to symbolize. The people who were moved to tears by our triumphal arch on Trafalgar Square or on City Hall Park, and there were many of them, were not moved to tears by anything about that arch that could be explained even by the most, scient the most meticulous scientific description of the object itself, any more or less, actually, than such a description of the original arch, so the one that stood in Palmyra, could explain a similar response in a different setting. They were moved to tears because through its close resemblance to an original physical object, one that they were familiar with, it had the power to remind them of a country full of people they love and of memories they cherish. It's all about the human response to a set of symbols, to a symbolism that that object has. Because I think um, contrary to what we might intuit, and what I suggested in my concept object slide at the beginning of my talk, cultural heritage is not actually about objects at all. It's about the relationship that we have with them. And I would argue that the authenticity of a cultural experience is all about actually our human response, not the physical specifics of something that we're responding to. If we're moved by an object, or a digital representation of an object, we are truly moved by it. Those emotions can't be voided by a technical or an academic assessment of the qualities of the object itself, as we were saying a moment ago. Simply, similarly, rather, um, if we're not moved by the object, purely on account of its lack of originality, that too, I think, is more a comment on the content of our relationship with the object than it is on anything else. The concept of originality, then, um, when present in an historical object, references the idea of continuity, of continuity that is beyond the time scale of a single human lifetime. And it does so in a way which is, I think, very important to Western culture, to our concept of self, um, to our relationship with our own part past, and also to our concept and relationship with the idea of our own future. So, you know, we have the, the idea of this is a monument that I visit, um, or an object that I hold in my hand. Um, my father and my grandfather did the same, maybe, you know, as too will my grandchildren. It's that kind of idea, which is very, very important to the way that we, in our Western culture, understand our relationship with the axis of time um, and the process of aging that we are as living things subject to. But I think it's important to observe that different people see things differently. So Far Eastern culture, for example, places a very high premium on the renewal and recreation of important objects, of important historical objects. So that is, if you like, a process of de-originalization and rebuilding, um, and that that they put as high a premium on that as we might do on their preservation, on the idea of keeping them uh, original. And, you know, since this is, uh, this is a festival which is very much about ideas, I think that one interesting observation um, that we might make about this is that 
given this level of cultural specificity, which is already evident. Um, so I've you know, talked very briefly about the contrast between common Eastern and Western uh, perspectives. Of course, this is a, it's always a very dangerous thing to make sweeping statements like I just have done, because the, the, the nuances um, of uh, the way that different uh, cultures relate to objects and relate to each other is in itself a very deep and very interesting topic, and one which uh, requires quite a lot of analysis uh, in order to be, uh, to be able to say, to make a single statement which is not, uh, which, which can't be somehow uh, treated with a counterexample. But I do think that in order to make progress here, um, it is very relevant to point to certain general apparent differences um, between the way that people from different cultures are accustomed to behave towards objects which, if you like, stand for their history, so to monuments in particular. And the fact that we can see those differences really, I think, speaks to a flexibility in human attitudes. So, in other words, um, though um, as people who have grown up in a Western culture, we might feel that we are, we're not innately bound to experience a uniquely high level of sort of sentimental attachment to original physical objects. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a cultural thing. And as tools in reproduction become better and more widespread, and in fact, as discourse on this issue expands. You know, 20 years ago, people were not talking about this issue because the kind of disruptive technology which exists now, like the tools that we have for physical recreation of objects, like the ability to create very interactive digital resources, um, which contain a lot of the, uh, the, the information which only previously was accessible to people by physically visiting an object or a site. These have really changed the way that we have to think um, about our, the, the, our experience of history and of how the, the, the content of the responses that we have to those experiences. So the question is, um, given this disruptive situation um, and an expansion of discussion around the issue, could it be the case that the norms could change so could originality become less important to us in the West as our ability to imitate it in convincing ways grows in application, in sophistication, um, and in the extent to which it's accepted as something that simply we do? Could it be the case that the concept of authenticity um, and also authenticity of experience become completely decoupled from the idea of original physical things? At the moment, it's not. So the idea is one of the, the, the problems that people who are concerned by originality face is the idea that if we have an experience in the presence of a non-original object, be it a physical one or a, or a virtual one, there is something non-authentic about that experience. There's something missing. And also, there is the idea, um, I think, uh, that is quite common that somehow we've been cheated. If we are responding in a way which is consistent with the idea of, a of an original object, but we're making those responses to a non-original object, there's something wrong. You know, something, it feels that, that there is this idea in our culture that somehow that embodies some sort of deception that is bad. Um, and that's caused by this coupling between authenticity and originality, which is certainly present, but can possibly be challenged. So, as I say, one question is, could it be the case? Could we imagine a world in which originality and authenticity are substantially more decoupled than they are today? And finally then, I think we would be amiss if we didn't ask ourselves, having posed that question, if that was the case, so if these two things could become decoupled, would that be something gained or would it be something lost? Thank you very much.
It's thirsty work. Oh, oh yeah, I'm all set. Thank you. This was also a way to bite myself some time, of course, because this was a whew, quite heavy talk. Uh, uh, it was, it was, um, it definitely made my head whirl, uh, and I'm very happy that I, I got the chance also to read through some of your notes in advance and kind of think about it a bit. So, so I came prepared in a way. I hope prepared enough because this was, uh, it was very deep, and I actually would like to. Maybe I, I'd like to start by asking you to cheekily, uh, uh, or by cheekily asking you to uh, uh, answer your own question that you ended with, the big philosophical question, the one that goes really to the heart of it. So, um, and I'll, I'll rephrase it in a way that I, I wrote it down. So, to what extent can replicas of, of the digital kind, of the, the 3D printed kind that you um, um, have made and, 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 and uh, exhibited, to what extent can replicas have the same symbolic value as original artifacts? And, and, uh, and can we have the same sentimental relationship to them? What would be the conditions of possibility in our society, in our culture, that need some transformation, that needs some rethinking for that to actually happen? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I, I, I don't expect you to answer it fully because that's your no, question, absolutely. right? But just it's, maybe we can speculate and you can, you can add to that later as well. But I, so I think that the most important part of my answer is that I don't know the answer. Um, I'm someone who feels completely torn by this issue because on the one hand, I have a kind of strong intuitive sense that there is something that can be... The, the symbolism of an original object can be carried through to a copy of that object in a way which can create a set of emotional responses which are very similar or at least very strongly related to the set of emotional intuitive responses that we have to, a, uh, to an original object. And as I mentioned in the talk, um, I believe that this is rooted in the fact that the way, the reason that objects matter to us is that they are, um, is that they, they, they are symbols of things which are much more intangible. Does and that so, require, a, uh, like, a, sorry to interrupt, but does that require a suspension of disbelief somewhere? A suspension of the, the think, the historical knowledge that we, like, or the, at least the fact that we think we know that that object has actually weathered through, it has endured all those hundreds, maybe thousands of years, and, and we have to kind of suspend that for, for that transposition to happen? I think that's right. I mean, what's, what is difficult to envisage is a situation where, and in, in fact, I think don't think, no, not desirable, um, is a situation where it is not possible to identify and talk about the differences between an original object uh, and a copy. So the concept of, um, of being deceived, if you like, um, which is the only alternative to suspension of belief if you see what I mean. So there, there are two possible options here. We can, we can be in a situation where we can create copies which, are, uh, which look like the original, but we're told that they are not the original, even though they have the features of the original. Um, or we can be in a situation where we envisage a world where the, the line is completely blurred, where there are original objects all over the place and there are also perfect copies. And there is the possibility of being let's say, inverted commas, deceived, but we never know where that deception is taking place. Now, what I would argue is that there's something, um, and this is, you know, this is a topic for discussion in itself, but it feels like something is, the, dan there's something dangerous about that second option because information is somehow being lost. You know, the, the fact that a particular has object has survived a particular amount of time in its original physical form is a piece of information that belongs to that object. And if we start recreating stuff willy-nilly um, and, and not making those important distinctions, then there, there's certainly a, loose, a loss of clarity in the status of the world that we live in. So if we go back to the idea of suspending belief, I think that the... The next question perhaps we have to pose is, is it necessary to suspend belief exactly, or 
just buy in to the idea that we can look at an object that is not original. It can remind us of something that is original. And that then provides us with the cues, if you like, to have those, uh, to, to have those discussions about history, to have those discussions about experiences that we want to have. And the question is, you know, will, if, if that becomes a much more familiar experience, so if we're constantly interacting with non-original objects and being encouraged to think about uh, history through the eye of those non-original objects. And I think it's important to, to remember here that when we're talking about it, we're talking not just about physical things, you know, not physical reproductions, but perhaps even more importantly, actually, digital reproductions of things, which are becoming very, very widespread um, and, of course, will, um, will accelerate in their uh, visibility much more quickly than, than physical objects that we can create with technology. Um, so... I, my own feeling is that attitudes could potentially change quite quickly. We've seen how children, for example, respond, uh, you know, growing up in a much more, in an environment where information is much more immediate, have produced, have developed a completely different relationship with information. Um, than those of us who, you know, grew up uh, as I did, uh, sort of lying on their tummy looking at encyclopedias to do their homework. You know, it's the the world has changed through information. Uh, people's attitudes to information have changed in a very in very significant ways just over the space of half a generation. And what we're talking about here is 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 just another manifestation of exactly the same thing. It's a change in attitudes towards information. Okay, um, but to what extent can cultural heritage be engineered, right? Because in that scenario that you sketch, the latter one, that in which we, um, in which our attitudes are changing towards the relationship between and the value we uh, we, we uh, attach to the original original versus the the copy, um, does doesn't might that not have the adverse uh, consequences perhaps? of somehow preempting the practice of cultural, or co the preservation of cultural heritage. Because that is, that is still fundamentally rooted in preserving, in, in actually preserving or restoring, so not replicating, but restoring the original and, and having an, a, a very much like a, a relationship to that. So when you move from preservation to replication, and you have these, the, the not sudden, but very over time, the switch uh, to these kind of attitudes, what happens to the original goal of, of, of your, uh, your, your, uh, um, your whole institute, but also especially the Syria, the Palmyra? Um, Absolutely, I, that's, a, that's a great point, and that's exactly why I'm quite agnostic about the whole situation. So what I'm not trying to do is to put forward a view that you know, we necessarily should um, forge these different relationships with originality and authenticity. And I think, you know, I, I speak as someone who's a complete contradiction. Uh, I was saying, you know, before the talk, I, I, I'm very, very interested in our relationship with originality and authenticity. I find it philosophically very interesting. And there are certain views which I hold about the way that, um, about attitudes which that maybe the, the origins of attitudes, which is what I've been talking about. But, you know, I'm someone who, I'm a passionate collector, collector of, um, of old books. Um, I, you know, I have a, a, a bookshelves full of volumes which are valuable, A, simply because they're old. Um, you know, which, and, and I could go and get a, you know, a new copy for, you know, possibly 10% of, uh, you know, of the, the, the value of the object. And also, you know, books that have been, have been previously owned by notable people, people that I feel some kind of interesting, you know, are interesting. So, you know, I'm very, uh, and, and I would not, I don't like the idea of not feeling that way towards those books. You know, it's something, it's part of me as a person. I find it very interesting. You know, I, 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 I view, I suppose, it's part of the way that I view the world, like I was talking about. You know, I, I like, when I read those books, I think about, you know, people who were writing them in the 17th century. Um, you know, and I also, you know, I think about the careers of scientists, for example, who, you know, who's, uh, some of whom's uh, sort of personal volumes I have. So I think, you know, we... We're at a time where the state of technology and the state of thinking 
is such that I think it's very important to explore the limits of A, what is possible and might happen, and B, whether there are measures that we need to take to make sure that we don't, um, if you like, kind of get carried away down a particular, a particular route which might have adverse consequences. Is IDA carrying us away? Well, I, I don't think so, no, because you know, what our, our project is actually geared towards two things. So one is the restoration, developing tools for the restoration of sites. Um, rather than the, reconst you know, the complete reconstruction. And this represents 90% of the work that needs to be done in archaeology. Now, we've seen over re recent years through the, um, unfortunately, the increasing prevalence of cultural cleansing kind of activities by groups, uh, terrorist organizations in particular, that there is a greater need than there has been in our lifetimes um, for the complete re reconstruction of objects that have been destroyed. But it's still the case that restoration is the key, um, is, is where the key need is. Now currently, restoration technology for objects like the Palmyra Arch is very low tech. Uh, it's based on a, a manual, old, you know, old fashioned manual technologies. In fact, essentially the same technologies that we used to build these objects 2000 years ago. And the, I believe that this is an area where innovation is very, very important. You know, if we want to reconstruct, sorry, if we want to restore objects that have been badly damaged, or simply objects which are currently lingering in um, in, in spaces, in museums, or in on on sites, but are not really accessible to the public because a lot of work needs to be done to them, there is an obvious. Um, opportunity here to use new technologies to tackle that problem. And the possibility of multiplying the speed with which we're able to perform reconstructions, uh, I think is one which we have, uh, you know, we would be, it, 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 it's, there's no reason not to take that step. You know, it's, it's exciting, um, it potentially, it, it creates employment for people, it regenerates sites, you know, on a, on a faster time scale than using traditional techniques. So, but it might also open Pandora's box in a way. I think um, it might, um, but I struggle to see how it could. How it could. Um, you know, the, the kind of technical innovation that we're using is still at a stage where it's, it, it's artisanal. Um, and as an organization, so that is, you know, we're not, this is not an industrial process. You know, this is a process which involves human hearts and minds and a lot of time. It's just, it just happens to be faster than doing it the old fashioned way. Um, and, you know, if, if there is a Pandora's box to be opened, I suppose, um, then one might argue that it was opened a long time ago when people started to envision the idea of creating uh, virtual renditions of, uh, of, of heritage sites. You know, once, once one introduces the concept of using information in a way which allows us to create non-original representations of things, um, you know, there is, the, there is the potential there for the way that we interact with the world to change. Um, you know, I mean, you could argue that it started with a photograph, right? Uh, you know, as soon as people were able to take away pictures of site of of uh, of, of cultural heritage, um, it reduced the extent to which uh, it was necessary necessarily to visit a place in order to experience it. Um, and I can imagine, you know, if you went back a hundred years and explained to people how far we'd come from there, there would be a lot of people who were very unnerved by um, the progress that had been made. Um, and unnerved in a way which we would think was uh, was unnecessary. Um, you know, I, I, I think that it would be hard to find. You know, there are not too many people out there who object on some basic level to the idea of creating a 3D rendering of an ancient site. You know, there are a few, but it's not a. You know, this is not a widespread view. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, to give a, a, a more compact answer to your question, uh, it, I think if a box is to be opened, then it's already been opened. It will naturally be opened by 
the human inquisitiveness and our ability to, or our tendency to do stuff that we're able to do with technology. You know, it's, it, people will experiment. Um, and I don't think that the, the, the relatively, uh, on a global scale, small scale interventions that we're proposing um, will have anything other than a, you know, a positive effect on the, the, the ways that people are able to experience sites in a traditional way. I guess that that's the other important thing. So this is making, it makes not just an impact on you know, the way that uh, people experience sites in a non-traditional way, so through, you know, through digital media, uh, but it also is very important to, or, or, or builds on the integrity of, uh, and the, the, the positive experience that people can have by actually physically visiting places. Also looking at the time now, um, I'd like to open it up to the audience and join us. And maybe someone in here has a question or a comment. I see one. Alexi, thank you for your talk. Um, I was interested by what you, uh, what you said about uh, information um, uh, on which you base the, the digital replicas. Um, because also the access to information um, implies that there is uh, that there is a loss, and that um, that certain qualities of the original physical objects are uh, are somehow isolated in the in the final replica, such as uh, surface and structure, for instance. Um, and my question to you would be: What is ultimately um, uh, what is the goal or what is the purpose of your endeavor? Is it like, does it lie more in uh, a cultural historical? Uh, is the goal more cultural historical or, or is it more educational didactical because you do say that people have a very emotional relationship to the to the final replica um, not as the original object so like, what what is the focus of the object that's a great question so I think the important thing to do is to draw a distinction between the installations that we had on Trafalgar Square and in New York and our goals overall as an organization so those installations were did two things so they they were a technical showcase so they showed people what was possible and they gave them the experience to you know to go and to go and touch something that had been made in an innovative way and they were also educational so the idea was to draw attention to um, you know as I said in the talk, our cultural link, the cultural links between East and West, the historical links, you know, the fact that uh, the neoclassical architecture of every you know, Western city is based on um, these, uh, these, the beginnings of that original classical tradition, which we can see also in the Middle East. Um, that is, you know, the, the structure that we built was not a structure that we would ever, you know, it was, it, it, it is not a, um, it is not a replacement in any way, shape, or form for that original object. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a piece of art. Um, you know, it has been said that it's a kind of new monument. You know, it's being. Um, I think it's come to stand for the uh, the, the the challenging um, circumstances which are experienced by the people of the of the region, by the courage of those people who have contributed to making it happen, and to those who. Um, have so bravely defended their history in that particular area of the world. So the, the installations are separate from the overall goal, which is an entirely practical one. So the goal of our organization is to support local stakeholders in reconstructing um, and restoring archaeological sites that have been damaged or in some cases destroyed. Um, you know, there's a, the, I, I'm, I think that there's a natural educational um, sort of spin-off of th those kinds of activities. But our, yeah, our goal is very clearly simply as um, people who are, are here to offer practical support to those local people who may want to, um, to, to have some support in, in restoring or, uh, or, or, uh, or replacing, if that's necessary, objects which have been damaged or uh, are no longer, um, no longer recoverable. Listening to you talk about it now makes me wonder whether uh, the notion of, or the question of authenticity is relevant at all. That's... Right? Like, just hearing you 
explain the main purposes, the di didactical and also a technical showcase, very much like, okay, this is what's possible, this is what we could do in this, in this context. It's a, it's a very uh, augmented reality aspect rather than, um, yeah, somehow it feels a bit detached from what we were just discussing uh, before, and I'd like you to maybe reflect on the on the, the the discrepancy that I feel, and you perhaps can sense that I feel. So, no, I agree. I actually feel that I, I feel that detachment myself. Interestingly enough, so um, I would say that our that that the link between what we're doing and the concept of authenticity is something which has played out in people's responses to the project. You know, this is, um, these discussions about originality and authenticity have risen up, you know, as a result of people who say, hey, you know, hang on, uh, you know, it's not the original object. You know, to which one very short response is, no, it's not the original object. You know, this isn't a conversation about authenticity. You know, this, we never said it was the original object. It's a copy. You know, it's just a, it, it, it's, you know, it's like a three-dimensional picture. Um, and, you know, and likewise, you know, on site, okay, of course, you know, we're going to be reconstructing stuff or restoring it. Um, it's not, you know, the, those, the pro, that process of restoration um, is going to lead to there being some non-original um, bits there. You know, it's very simple. Um, and no, you know, it's got nothing to do with the idea of authenticity. The authenticity comes in through people's intuitive responses to the concept of, the reproduction of, um, or the, the, the creation of a copy. And in a way, you know, I mean, that's, I, I'm so glad you asked that question because in a way, you know, the, the, that, that, that really underpins, uh, you know, the whole of the, the, the discussion that I, you know, that, that, that I was, uh, that I began in the talk, you know, the, the connection between the concept of copying and the con concept of authenticity is one which is made by people in an intuitive kind of way. But when you start to examine it, you know, it's not necessarily either um, uh, uh, necessary um, nor obvious once you break down you know, into individual components the actual project that you've embarked on. But it's especially, I guess, because we're talking about all of this in, within the field, of, within the context of cultural heritage, right? And history, and material history, cultural history, because, I mean, of course, I mean, as this whole uh, conference, this uh, whole impact is proving, and we all kind of know, we are used to living with replicas and, 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 and bots and, and the artificial and the, you know, the, uh, the non-authentic or whatever that means. But when we, you know, talk about these things in relationship to something where the desire for the authentic, authentic experience and some connection to history is so, you know, clear and present, then these issues start to become uh, all of a sudden more problematic than if we would talk about these things in, for instance, in relation to architecture or whatever. Right? That's exactly it. Yeah, it, it's simply it's simply an area where we have some uh, we have a preconceived idea about the content, what the kind of content of an experience has to be in order for it to be authentic, to be, for it to be kind of right for us. You know, and there are many areas, like you say, you know, where that simply isn't an issue. Um, so it's not an issue. You know, so it doesn't, it doesn't enter in even to the way that we think about um, a, 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 you know, d different other areas of our, of, of our existence. Just because I see we're almost in, I see you. Uh, so um, I just want to make sure, uh, see if somebody else has a question here, because there's only been one question. So just wanted to, I'll, I'll, first somebody else, <laughs> and then I'll, <laughs> anyone? Questions, comments, remarks? Hi there. Um, you were talking about monumentality as well. Um, I know. I, I know there's a practice going right now um, where they're looking at alternative ways of of burying people, and it's an environmental imperative, for example, that they're not, you know, they're not going through this traditional burial practice anymore. It's more, you know, people getting buried under a tree or things like that. Um, that's like an example I can think of of monument monumentality changing. Are there any sort of other imperatives you know of that are affecting the relationship we have to monumentality? 
That's an interesting question. I mean, I think um, the way that we, th the permanence of monuments, I think, is now something that has some kind of gradient um, because of the fact that people, you know, we, we live in a, a world now which, where there's an awful lot of communication between individual between individuals. So we live a kind of highly individualized existence against the backdrop of a, 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 a sort of an architectural format, in some cases, which dates from a time where um, there was a much less individualized experience of everyday life. So what I mean by that is, you know, the, the great monuments um, of our cities were built... Um, you know, way before this, the time when um, people, uh, you know, b before the, the kind of information age. And I think that they have a power by virtue of the fact that they have existed through the generations, um, that they predate, you know, that, that process. I think now um, it's possible for people to create monuments of different kinds, either virtually and actually, and participate in, um, you know, their the, you know, practices in connection with them. So, you know, maybe they're, you know, it may be a monument to an individual or to a, an organisation, something like that. They can do it in a very private way. So, monumentality, if you like, has now moved from something which was necessarily public and dramatic and um, it was a kind of community thing or nothing at all to something which can still be that. And I think, you know, that's one of the reasons why these monumental structures are so important because they still have that function. And they remind us as well that we are not individuals. We are also part of a community. And I think that that is something which is surprisingly important to us, you know, in the everyday. I think we've, you know, it's very easy to move away from the idea of being part of a community because one is constantly reminded through the way that we interact with people and with information that we're an individual. So those, st you know, there are still those traditional monuments, but there is also this possibility of having more private um, and more particular and more um, less well structurally defined objects um, or places that that form that uh, perform the same function. Thanks. Thank you. With that, we have come to the end of this uh, talk and discussion. Um, first of all, I would love to thank you, Alexi, thank you. for your talk. Uh, and then I'd like to thank you for being here on a Friday afternoon. Um, and that's it. Thanks. Thanks so much. <laughs>